All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, let's turn together, if you would please, the book of 1 Samuel. The book of 1 Samuel in chapter 3. The book of 1 Samuel chapter 3. On Father's Day, we, as I said a moment ago, we honor fathers. We all understand that fathers, that's the man who is the dashing, handsome prince in the life of every young girl. He's also the strong, brave hero in the life of every young boy. That's what fathers are. In fact, as I was preparing this sermon, I read about two boys who were having an argument in the schoolyard. And they're arguing back and forth, back and forth. Finally, they start to run out of they start to run out of steam. They start to run out of things to say to each other. And so finally, boy one said, Well, my dad is bigger than your dad. Another little boy said, oh yeah? He said, well, my dad's smarter than your dad. The first little boy responded, oh well, (laughs) my dad makes more money than your dad. The other little boy said, well, that's nothing. My dad can beat up your dad. (laughs) Another boy looked at him and said, well, that's nothing. My mom can do that. And we laugh at that, but you know the fact is every child begins their life looking up to dad. They begin their life thinking about him as being the strongest, the smartest, the bravest, most handsome, whatever man in the world. And the fact is, even though all of those things may be true, I mean they all may be true, but the reality is many times as fathers we fail to be the godly fathers that we ought to be for our children. We fail to be the godly father that we ought to be. And we all understand that every man can be our teacher. Every man can be our instructor. On the, on the positive side, some will teach us things that we ought to do. And on the negative side, we can learn sometimes from our fathers what we should not do. And things that we ought to avoid. And it's actually from that point of view that I want us to consider a man that we that we find in our Bible together for the next few minutes. The story of a man who failed. He failed as a father. I want you to in your imagination to go with me to a wake. I know that's kind of depressing, but I want you in your imagination, go with me to a wake and. And I want us to consider that we're visiting the wake of a man who has recently passed away. And as we meet together, we begin, we begin sitting, you know, around the table. We begin to share our stories. We begin to talk about this one whose wake we are attending. And, and so as we, as we meet there at the wake, we, we, we begin to talk about, first of all, we talk about his name, how that his, his name is, is Eli. And, uh, and then we also see, we also see his occupation. We, we talk about how that he was a high priest in Israel. Uh, and so we talk about his occupation. And, and then we also we, we talk about his description. Uh, this is kind of personal. But he was overweight, okay? Uh, he, he, he was kind of big. Uh, and so, and so we, we, we talk about how he might have lived longer. Uh, had he not been so fat, okay? And, and so we, we talk about his, his fact. But then we also talk about the age he was at his death. Uh, he, according to the Bible, he's 98 years old. He's 98 years old. And so we talk about the longevity that he had. And, and then we also talk about the cause of his death. What, what was it that happened? How, how did he die? And, and we find out that he suffered a broken neck after falling backward off of a chair. And so we, we talk about these things. But then as we, as we share our memories of this man, as we share our memories of this man, some good, some not so good, I want you to understand that we would all have to agree. We would all have to agree. Point number one. When we think about Eli, human level, he is a good man. He's a good man. He's a good man. He's a good man, first of all, because of some excellent character qualities that could be seen in his life. Remember, people would remember him. They they would speak well of him, first of all, because of his morality. Because of his morality through the long years of his life. We cannot find any record in the Bible of some terrible sin in the life of Eli. We cannot find any record of some terrible sin. We don't find any record of Eli uh, being a drunkard. 
We, we don't even find him being a social drinker. Uh, he, he stayed away from alcohol. He, he was never accused of being a thief. He's never accused of stealing. He's never accused of lying. Never accused of swearing. Never accused of taking God's name in vain. He's never accused of divorcing his wife or living in immorality, committing adultery. He's never accused of physically abusing his children. In other words, morally, this is a pretty good guy. He's morally a good man. And people would speak about how good he was to his family. How good he was in providing for them. But, but then they would also remember not only his morality, they would remember his humility. His humility. When, when the young lady Hannah, you remember the story. The young lady Hannah came to the tabernacle. and She wants to pray. She doesn't have a child and, and her desire is that she might have a man child. And so she comes to the temple childless and there she begins to pray that God will bless her with a son. And, and you remember Eli responded to her with kindness. He responded to her, encouraged her with a wonderful promise that her prayers, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 17, her prayers are going to be answered. Her prayers will surely be answered. And then when Hannah, filled with her promise to the Lord, was fulfilling her promise to the Lord God that she would, if God would give her a son, she would give him back to serve the Lord. And so when she came to fulfill her promise, you remember that Samuel, uh, Samuel was brought and, and Eli, Eli treated Samuel with kindness, took him under his wing, mentored him, taught him uh, and, and helped him, even though, even though he knew that Samuel was going to replace his family in the office of a high priest. He knew that. And yet he responds with kindness to Samuel. There was no trace of pride, no trace of anger, no trace of jealousy. And in fact, listen, when Eli came to understand that Samuel is going to replace his family in the office of the high priest, here's his response. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 18. It is the Lord. In other words, this is God's will. This is God's doing. Let Him do what seemeth good. His humility. His humility. Not only do we see His morality, His humility, we also see letter D, His dedication. His dedication. The fact that Eli had a deep love for the ark of God was clearly evident. You remember the ark of God? That was that, that, was that box that, that rested in the, that, in the tabernacle in that area called the Holy of Holies. And over that box, you remember, there were the two cherubim that reached out and they stretched out their wings over what was called the mercy seat. And it was in that place where God Himself came down and dwelt among His people. And Eli had a deep love for the ark of God because of the fact that the ark of God symbolized the very presence of God. And because of that, for that reason, when the ark was carried into battle against the Philistines by the armies of Israel, they came and got the ark. Things weren't going well. And they thought, well, if we'll take the ark, that will be a help for us. And so they came and got the ark. They carried it into the field of battle. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse number 13. Eli was scared to death that something might happen to the ark of God. He's scared to death that the ark might be taken to, by the enemy. And so in great anxiety, he sits by the gate of the city watching for the ark to be brought back to its proper place in the tabernacle. But then he heard that the ark of God, just as he had feared, the ark of God was captured by the Philistines. They've taken the ark of God away. They've taken the ark of God away and, and, and Eli is so overcome with grief because the ark of God has been stolen. He's so overcome with grief that he falls backward off of his chair. He broke his neck and he died. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 18. Bottom line, right up to the time of his death, right up to the time of his death, Eli was a man who... He had the reputation. He had the reputation. He would be fondly remembered. 
He would be fondly remembered as a man who was honorable, moral, humble. He he would be fondly remembered. That was the reputation that he had as a godly man who was deeply concerned about the spiritual things of God. But you need to remember there's some words that we need to be reminded of in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. The Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. In other words, I want us to notice that while in the eyes of men, Eli was a good man. He was a good man, well thought of, had a great reputation in Israel. But I want you to understand that from God's point of view, he saw things differently. And from God's point of view, Eli was a huge failure. He's a huge failure. You see, what people thought of Eli, that was his reputation. Now please understand there's an important difference here. What people thought about Eli, that was his reputation. But Eli's character, that's something different. Eli's character, that's something different. D.L. Moody, the great evangelist of years gone by in America, I think said it very well. He said this, Character is what you are in the dark. In other words, reputation is what people see you do, but your character, that's going to be revealed by what you do when nobody's looking. That's going to prove the reality of a godly character. When you are godly and nobody is watching, nobody sees it. While Eli, as the high priest, had a good reputation publicly, his character, in other words, what he was privately, when nobody's watching, nobody's looking, his, his character was not so good. Character is not so good. But of course, the Lord God, the Lord God knew exactly all about what was going on in, Le- in Eli's heart. E- even though the people didn't know all of the secrets of Eli, God did. And that's why we find in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse number 27, that there came a man of God unto Eli. There comes a man of God to Eli, and he gives to Eli in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 31, down to verse number 36. He gives to Eli a terrible, a terrible prophecy. He tells Eli his family is going to be cut off from serving in the priesthood. His family is going to be cut off from serving as a high priest. Not only that, his two sons, Hopni and Phinehas, they're going to both die the very same day. And not only that, his family, because they have been shut out of the priesthood, they're going to become beggars. They're going to become beggars begging food. Because no longer will they be allowed to partake of the food that God provided for the priesthood through the offerings of His people. And so they're going to become beggars. And the reason for all of that is because as a father, as a father, even though he's a good man, got a great reputation, but as a father, he had failed. He had failed in several areas. First of all, I want you to notice he failed by his wicked example. He failed by his wicked example. Verse number 29 of chapter 2. Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my habitation? This is the accusation against Levi. He has kicked against the sacrifice. He's kicked against the the offerings that the Lord God commanded. He kicked at those offerings that were brought into the tabernacle. In other words, he despised them. He despised the portion of the sacrifice. He despised the portion of the offerings that the Lord God had allotted to the priesthood and to the high priest. You find that Leviticus chapter 7, verse 31 to verse number 34. God had set a a thing in place where where that when people brought their offerings and their sacrifices, the priests were allowed to have a part of that. In other words... Levi just wasn't satisfied with what was allowed. He wanted more. 
He wanted more. And he began to greedily take more than what was right. He began to greedily take more than what was right. And the motivation for his action in verse number 29, notice it, it's to make yourselves, that is himself, his sons, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Fathers, I want us to understand this morning that our words, our words, the things that we say, no matter how loudly we may shout them, our words will never influence our children as much as our actions. Our words will never influence our children as much as our actions. Eli's sons, they saw what dad was doing. They, they saw how Levi or how Eli was what was despising the offerings of God and, and abusing the privilege God had given to him. And so we find, first of all, there was his wicked example, letter B. There's also his misplaced devotion. His misplaced devotion. You remember the Lord God said something interesting concerning Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, verse number 19. God says concerning Abraham, I know him. I know him. By the way, God knows you too. Okay? Just to let you know. God knows you. He knows me. And, and, and so the Lord God says, I know him. I know Abraham. And here's what I know about him. I know that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. God said, I know that about Abraham. I know he will command his family. He'll command his children. He'll be the leader. He'll be the example for his family that he ought to be. I know him. I know he'll do that. But Eli was no Abraham. Eli was no Abraham. In fact, notice how it is stated. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse number 29, Thou honorest thy sons above me. You honor your sons more than you honor me. In other words, Eli was more interested in pleasing his sons, giving to them whatever they wanted, allowing them to do whatever they wanted, allowing them to, to go anywhere that they wanted. He was more interested in pleasing his sons than he was in pleasing God. That's the accusation. Because of Eli's failure as a father to set a good example, because of his failure to command his children and to command his household as he should, there naturally followed, let her see, the tragic consequences. There came his tragic consequences. Verse number 12. The sons of Eli were sons of Belial. In other words, they are basically wicked men of no spiritual value to themselves or to anybody else. They have no spiritual value for themselves or for anybody else. They're, they're sons of Belial. They're given over, given over to wickedness. And, and, and the reason is because they knew not the Lord. Now certainly these sons of Eli knew about the Lord God. I mean, that's obvious. I mean, they work in the tabernacle. They're, they're, they're around the tabernacle all the time. They're, 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 they're tending to the sacrifices. They're, they're bringing in the, all of those things that were involved in ministering there in the tabernacle. They knew all about that. They knew all about God. The tragedy was their knowledge of God was only up here. They only had a head knowledge of God. That head knowledge had never moved down to their heart and changed their life. Sadly, I fear that many children in Christian homes, the same thing can be said of them. They know about God. Mom and dad take them to church. They sit in Sunday school. They sit in the junior church. They get a little bit older. They come into the auditorium. They hear the preaching of God's Word. They know about God. They know about God. But the sad reality is, is that knowledge of God has never moved down to the heart. And they've never truly been born again. They have all this head knowledge. 
but they've never truly been born again. I cannot think of a greater tragedy than for parents to raise their children in church and for their children to die and go to hell. We, we give them everything, but what does it profit our child if they get the whole world, but they lose their own soul? Right? What, what, is it, what profit is there? What profit is there? And that's exactly what we find here in the life of Eli's sons. They knew about the Lord God, but they did not have a personal relationship with Him. And, and you know what the result was? Chapter 2, verse 17, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Good friend of mine, pastors in the state of Florida in the U.S., I heard him make this statement many times. Here's what he said. He said, what parents do in moderation, their children will do in excess. Wow, that's a frightening thought if you think about it. What, what parents do in moderation, yeah, their kids will always take it a step further. They'll take it a step further. They'll begin to do it in excess. And that was exactly true in the light in the family of Eli. The Bible says, as we noted before, the sons of Eli, they've seen their dad taking more of the offerings than he should. He was taking more than was allotted to him. And so it's no surprise his sons began to do the same thing. But they go even further. They go even further. You see, sin is like a cancer. It always grows and it grows bigger and it grows bigger and it grows bigger and it grows more and more and more deadly. And so therefore, the sin of Eli's sons, it escalated. They had abhorred the offerings of the Lord, not only by taking more than was allotted to him, but they sinned even more by demanding it from the people. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 13 to verse 17, those boys actually begin to threaten, you give us more of your offering, you give us more of the best parts of your offering, or we will take it by force. Wow. Take it by force. And then their wickedness escalated even further. They abhorred the offerings of the Lord as they began having illicit sexual relationships, 1 Samuel 2.22. They began having illicit sexual relationships with the women who would bring their offerings. And they did it at the very door of the tabernacle. God's house. That's the sons of Eli. That's the sons of Eli. And so the Bible says in 1 Samuel 2, verse 22, Now Eli was very old, heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. What a terrible way to see your life ending as an old man. To see your children living in such wickedness and such sin. What a tragedy. What a tragic circumstance. And, and, and a lot of that is because of this next thing that I want us to notice, and that is his double standard. His double standard. You remember I told you a minute ago about Hannah? How that Hannah came to the, to the tabernacle and, and she wanted to pray, right? She wanted to pray. She was childless. And so she wanted to pray that God, would, that God would give her a child, that God would specifically give her a man-child. And the promise was, God, if you'll, if you'll give me a man-child, I'll return him to you so that he may serve you all the days, all the days of his life. And so as Hannah comes, her, her heart is burdened, her heart is heavy. And so she comes into the tabernacle and, and she's praying to the Lord. And notice what it says, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 13 and verse 14. Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved. And, and uh, her lips are moving, but no words can be heard. She's, she's speaking in her heart. And only her lips moved. Her voice was not heard. And so therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. 
In other words, based on his own thoughts, based on his own suspicions, without any real evidence to prove otherwise, Eli, Eli had been quick to ask a condemning question and to give an unnecessary command. He was just like that. He did that. But when it came to his own family, Eli was far more passive. What he expected of others, he did not require for his own house. In fact, in verse number 22, you remember it? When Eli was very old, he heard all that his sons did. Later on, the Lord God made it clear to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13. Eli, he knew about the wickedness of his sons. He had the facts. He had the evidence. He had the testimonies. But he did nothing to restrain them. He did nothing to restrain them. Rather, he simply gave them a mild, anemic rebuke. In verse number 22, or verse 23 to verse 25, he says to his sons, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? One commentator noted this. He said, Eli, in this position, did the worst possible thing that a parent can do in trying to correct their children. He just talked to them. He just talked to them. He never took the biblical actions that were required. He never followed the biblical principles that were expected. You see, he should have removed those boys from their position. He should have removed them from their position. They have disqualified themselves as priests of God. He should have removed them from their position. But even more, according to the law, Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10, he should have had them put to death. He should have had them put to death instead of allowing their wicked actions to bring shame, to bring reproach on the Lord God of Israel. He should have dealt with it, but he didn't do it. He didn't do it. Bottom line, when it came to being a father, Eli was a failure because he was passive in dealing with his sons. When they were young, when they were young. By the way, these sins that I mentioned a moment ago, figuring from the age of Eli, those boys are already in their late 30s, 40s, maybe even early 50s. They're grown men. But see, the problem didn't start when they were grown men. The problem started when they were kids. The problem started in when they were just a child. And, and the problem was that instead of using the rod of correction when those boys were young, as the wise man said, to drive foolishness out of the hearts of his sons, Proverbs twenty two fifteen. Instead of using the rod of correction to deliver the souls of his sons from hell, Proverbs 23, verse 13 and verse number 14. Instead of doing that, Eli... He set a bad example before them. Eli, as he saw them becoming worse and worse, remained passive until the point in time came when he has lost all of his abilities to influence them at all for God. It's all gone now. He's lost the whole thing. In fact, notice what it says in chapter 2. Verse 25, they, talking about those boys, they hearken not unto the voice of their father because the Lord would slay them. Kind of like Pharaoh when God hardened his heart. Because Pharaoh refused to do what God said, there came a time when God said, okay, that's it. I'm going to harden your heart. And that's what he did with these boys. 
He's hardened their heart because of their sin, their perpetual sin. They have refused to repent. Eli has refused to deal with it. And so the consequences are going to come. God has determined He's going to slay them. He's going to slay them. Bottom line, Eli is a failure because while he was desiring to honor his sons, he actually ended up damning them. He wanted to honor them, but he ended up damning them. Regardless of what your family may think about you and regardless of what your friends may think, when God Himself examines the reality of your life, let me ask you this. Fathers, will He see you as a father who raised your children by your words and by your example? Not just your words, but by your words and your example. Will God see you as a father who raised your children to obey and to love and to serve God? Will, will He see that? Or will He see you as a father who raised your children by the words that you spoke and the things that you did? Will God see you as a father who raised your children to be rebels against God? Something to think about, men. Something to think about. Awesome responsibility that God has given to the fathers to be the spiritual leaders, to be the spiritual examples for our families. And certainly we are all going to fail at times, but may our failure never become a habit of life. May we come to a point where we are willing to acknowledge our sin, confess our sin, make things right with God, make things right with our kids, and do what God would have for us to do. May that be a reality for each of us. And let me just say to you this morning, if you're here and you have never trusted in Christ as, a sa as your Savior, there is no way, no way that you can raise a family that will be spiritually pleasing to God. Your children may turn out right, but it won't be because of you. It'll be because of God's mercy and God's grace to you as your children have been reached by others in a way that you failed to reach them. May God help none of us this morning to be failures as fathers. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning for each one here today. Lord, I pray that You would take these few thoughts. Lord, I realize that not really a message that is pleasant to hear. And yet it's a message that is so very important. Because the eternal destiny of our children depends on how well we do and representing You before our kids. Lord, I pray for each father here this morning that they would be not only with the words of their mouth, but by the life that they live, that they would be the teacher, the example for their children of what it means to be a godly man, to be a godly young lady. Lord, I pray for the father here this morning who has not yet trusted Christ. And I pray today would be a day of salvation for them. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.